materials that didn't pass last session that are kind of looking more promising this year? We passed about 20 of those bills today. Uh, and we did those by gathering up all the bills that passed last year from the Senate that had 30 or more votes, so overwhelming support, and we kind of ran those out today. Lots of different things. They're, uh, I think what most people would consider kind of smaller bills. They're not massive education reforms or anything like that, um, but they do address some issues that the public has brought to their legislators, and we're trying to get those bills over to the House of Delegates as soon as possible so that they can take them up and possibly pass them this year, uh, at bills that they chose not to pass last year. Was there any in specific that you remember? You know, so many different things. I, I you know, I always try to work with our, our first responders. There was one bill in particular that provided some additional protection to firefighters if, if they were to develop cancer. Uh, and the reasoning is that some of the chemicals and sprays that firefighters use make them a little bit more prone to develop cancer and this is a bill that, that would, would address that. And so if a firefighter were to develop certain types of cancer that their work may make them more likely to, to, to get, uh, this would provide workers' comp benefits to them. Um, are there any bills that you're pushing specifically for for your district? Um, I've got a little package of education bills that I'm working on. Children in West Virginia start to school before 90% of the other children in America. I think our kids start to school too soon in the morning. They don't get the proper sleep and rest. That impacts their development, impacts their ability to learn. And our teenage drivers going to high school, they're oftentimes out on the roads ahead of the division of highways who are attempting to clear the ice and snow off the roads. So I think it's dangerous, it's counterproductive, so I want to try to push back uh, that start time so that kids have a better chance to be successful in school. And we're going to start with a discussion around 7.45 a.m. That may move a little bit each direction, uh, but, but I think some of the schools now that are starting at 7 a.m., I uh, believe it's counterproductive, and we want our students to be successful. All right. Are there any others in specific? Yeah. The, the, uh, we have seen... Uh, a problem with absenteeism among our students. We've seen an even greater problem with absenteeism among our teachers. And part of that might have been caused by some changes as to how teachers are able to use their personal leave days. In the past, teachers more my age, they were able to use their personal leave days to help enhance their retirement and to provide health insurance in their years prior to being eligible for Medicare. The younger teachers don't have those benefits anymore, so they don't see the value of saving their personal leave days, and as such, they tend to take more time off. And that impacts learning. You know, at the end of the day, we want that certified teacher with a prepared lesson plan in front of those students 180 days. And we don't want those teachers taking days off simply because they believe their personal leave days aren't of value to them. So we're looking at two approaches. One, to allow those teachers to have access to use those leave days for retirement or health insurance. A less expensive option is to sort of allow those teachers to buy back or sell back those days to their county board of education. And we think we can more than pay for it. Right now, when a teacher doesn't show up for school, they call in and they take the day off, the county spends about $150 to hire a sub. What we're saying is, if we can encourage that teacher to show up and the school board doesn't have to spend that $150, maybe we could spend an amount less than that to that teacher to incentivize them to, to not use all those personal leave days in that way. If they need them and they're sick, we understand that, but, but we want to try to curb our teacher absenteeism problem and improve the success of our students. Bill 324 and it's reorganizing school building authorities to school maintenance authority. The, the school building authority was a tremendous initiative in West Virginia. And I'm gonna take just a little bit of credit and tell you that I cast the deciding vote in the House of Delegates in 1994 to create the school building authority. 
It was a vote of 48 to 46. And if I had voted no, it would have been 47 to 47, and we would have not had the school building authority in West Virginia. And I really believed that we needed a body that could gather information statewide as to the needs for classrooms and new schools, and a body that then had the financial authority to borrow money and, and help build those schools. And I think it's been relatively successful over the years. Um, what some people have begun to complain about is that a lot of schools need maintenance. And at times the school building authority formula has maybe incentivized closing schools to build and open new schools as opposed to maintain existing schools. And that's a delicate balance. And my sense is that approach might not be the best approach, but the approach of providing more dollars for the maintenance and improvement of existing schools is probably needed from the state because we have some very small rural counties that don't have the financial resources to maintain all of their schools the way they should be. We want our children to be in a safe environment, safe schools, all the provisions of the Safe Schools Act, an act that I helped write many years ago and has been improved upon over time. We want them to have the ability to, to be able to have cafeterias and gyms and activities you know, to help them learn. Uh, and in some places we don't have that. And so we do want to try to level the playing field and make all of our classrooms safe and accessible and, and allow kids to be successful. Okay, Bill 324. And it's reorganizing school building authorities to school maintenance authority. The, the school building authority was a tremendous initiative in West Virginia. And I'm going to take just a little bit of credit and tell you that I cast the deciding vote in the House of Delegates in 1994 to create the School Building Authority. It was a vote of 48 to 46. And if I had voted no, it would have been 47 to 47, and we would have not had the School Building Authority in West Virginia. And I really believed that we needed a body that could gather information statewide as to the needs for classrooms and new schools, and a body that then had the financial authority to borrow money and, and help build those schools. And I think it's been relatively successful over the years. Um, what some people have begun to complain about is that a lot of schools need maintenance. And at times the school building authority formula has maybe incentivized closing schools to build and open new schools as opposed to maintain existing schools. And that's a delicate balance. And my sense is that approach might not be the best approach, but the approach of providing more dollars for the maintenance and improvement of existing schools is probably needed from the state because we have some very small rural counties that don't have the financial resources to maintain all of their schools the way they should be. We want our children to be in a safe environment, safe schools, all the provisions of the Safe Schools Act, an act that I helped write many years ago and has been improved upon over time. We want them to have the ability to, to be able to have cafeterias and gyms and activities you know, to help them learn. Uh, and in some places we don't have that. And so we do want to try to level the playing field and make all of our classrooms safe and accessible and, and allow kids to be successful. Okay, Bill 418, authorizing reinstitution to victims of security fraud. Um, that's a big issue going on around here as of recently. And I'm not sure if that exactly ties into the AARP bill, if that's like the same thing or if that's something that they were uh, trying to do on their own. But what, what is your take on that? We do have instances where uh, seniors particularly are taken advantage of. And I work in the financial services industry and, and shame on those folks that prey on our seniors and try to uh, you know, commit acts of fraud, and I think they should be punished and punished severely. And what this does is it's an effort to try to reimburse to some degree some of the loss uh, that a senior may have experienced in those circumstances. Um, there is a level of regulation now, some of it in the West Virginia Auditor's Office, uh, and, and maybe we need to review, maybe we need to be doing more, um, maybe we need to enhance penalties, Maybe we need to try to 
help return some dollars to folks um, who have who have uh, had money stolen from them. And this isn't somebody who invested in something and it, and it lost money. I mean, that's going to happen. Um, this is money that was stolen um, and maybe fraudulent papers were prepared to show somebody that certain monies existed. Um, this is the typical American greed TV show of a Ponzi scheme uh, at work. And, and so we definitely want to discourage that activity in West Virginia and punish it. So there's a lot of conversation going on around capital punishment for drug possession. It seems to be uh, a huge thing, specifically fentanyl. Do you believe that this is something that would help with the epidemic that's taking over a state? And what are the chances of this actually passing? I don't know what the chances are, but let me tell you kind of globally what the thinking is in the Senate Republican Caucus. The thought process is, what could we do as a state to make being in the drug business the last place in America you would want to come? That's what we're talking about. How can we pass laws, rules, regulations, procedures, have enforcement such that somebody who wants to sell drugs says, I ain't going to West Virginia. There's too much risk to me personally. And so there's a lot of talk about that. You know, is it time to re-examine the needle exchange program? You know, has it worked? Has it failed? Uh, has it created a point where a drug dealer knows if I hang out around that spot, people are going to show up and get clean needles and want to use the drug products that I'm selling. So all those kinds of things, uh, you know, we're having discussions about what can we do. And, and, and the, the, you know, the fentanyl possession turning into potentially capital punishment um, with a cocktail that includes fentanyl is something that's being discussed. Uh, but I would say bigger than any one of those bills is a discussion of 70,000 Americans are dying a year from fentanyl that's pouring across an open border. Some of it's coming to West Virginia, and we want to try to stop that. There was, a, I know you're traveling a lot today, so I'm not sure how aware you are of the situation going on in Cheat Lake up today with the, the roadways, how there was, was it? Some sort of separation in the Cheat Lake Bridge um, that caused a bunch of people. It, it sounds like a piece of rebar broke loose, poked oh up, my. and was flattening Interstate? tires. Interstate? Interstate yeah, Bridge? Yeah, 68 West. Oh boy, um, boy, yeah. We didn't know if you'd heard about that or if I if have not yet. Yeah, were I any have. sort of general uh, concerns or comments you could make about the state of roads in our yeah. in our region. You know, we. Um, We've sort of found ourselves uh, in the past 12 months with as much construction as at any point in the history of West Virginia. So there's a lot of construction occurring. There are a lot of bridges being repaired and replaced. Um, I think the pocket or the hole in Division of Highways now uh, has become maintenance. And the simple maintenance of, of potholes, of mowing the grass and the medians, and, and all, all those kinds of things is where I think we're, we're not getting it done. Are we having more road construction, bridge repairs, slip repairs? Uh, we are, and we're having them at a greater uh, number than any point in the state's history. So that's very positive. We need to find a way to properly maintain our roads. Uh, and we're really, in my, in my opinion, we're coming up short there. And it's all kinds of things. I mean, it's brush along the side of the roads, it's, it's the clearing of the ditches. That's so important on the sides of the road because when water hits a road, it wants to have somewhere to go. And if it can't get off to the sides easily, it tends to stay on the road, and then it freezes and thaws and destroys the road. Um, so I think a lot more work can be done in maintaining our roads. I'm reaching a point where I'm of the belief that we can't do it, that the Division of Highways can't do that and that they have to reach out to private contractors to support their efforts. And the reason why I say that is, you know, I live in Montague County, and the labor market is such that when the Division of Highways attempts to hire people to work at the local Division of Highways office, they have a real difficulty doing that, and they have difficulty maintaining those workers, where those dollars might be better spent 
entering into a private contract with a company that can come in and support some of those efforts. And the same is true for you know, snow and ice removal. So that's, that's the direction that I think we, we need to go, particularly in the counties where the hourly wage is higher and it's difficult to hire public employees to do that kind of work. Is there anything I maybe forgot to ask that you wanted to mention? Yeah. You know, the governor really threw out a lot of issues during the state of the state, everything from a pay raise for all public employees and teachers to more money for schools and every conceivable program. And so, you know, we're going to spend the next 50 some days trying to figure out what we can afford within that um, because we have several things built into the budget already. You know, we passed what we called the Third Grade Success Act where we're gonna put teacher aides in every first grade, second grade, and third grade classroom in the state. And right now we're spending $33 million to do first grade. And next year, 33 million more for second grade, and the third year, 33 million more. So we've got these types of things where we have future obligations. So you can't just look at this year's budget and say, do we have enough money to do this? Um, we have the Hope Scholarship, which will give parents the flexibility to decide if they want to go to different school options, and, and that's going to cost more in the future. Um, we have tax cuts that can potentially kick in with certain triggers that will cost more. You know, we're trying to bring our National Guard members out of the prisons and jails and hire corrections officials, and there'll be costs associated with that. We're trying to help our hospitals, particularly our rural hospitals. Um, so there's so many things that um, we have to figure out of all the things he proposed, what we can afford to do.